Well, hello, and today it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nick, Nick, I'm going to say his name wrong, Narbutovsky, Narbut no, I've said that wrong again. Anyway, it's fine. You, correct me, Nick, what was it? It's Narbutovsky. Narbutovsky, that's it. I've got my vowels the wrong way around. Okay, sorry about that, Nick. Um, and I can't wait to um, talk to Nick, actually. Nick is, um, is in the military and has been for 17 odd years, but almost became a professional skier, I believe, at, at high school. Um, and is also now a public speaker and an author, both fiction and non-fiction books. So I'm intrigued, I have to say. Um, so welcome, Nick. Thank you very much for, for coming on today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate it. Brilliant. Um, well, the way I normally do my podcast is I'm really intrigued to know you know, the younger Nick, how, how you got to where you've got to today. Um, and as you know, this podcast is about not settling in life. So it would be great for me and the listeners to understand any sort of moments in your life where, you know, there was that pivotal change. Um, but also how you got into speaking and, and being an author, as well as obviously doing a very hard job in the military that you're doing. Um, and what that's like, you know, and, and really what, what all of that means to you and how you, you went from almost professional skier to doing what you're doing now. So I'll, um, I'll hand over to you. A little bit of background would be amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we can, we could definitely start back. I'm not going to bore everybody with my, with my full life story or anything, but, um, before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge just a couple of things. Um, I, I had a very lucky upbringing. Um, my, my mom was a, a great woman, single professional. Um, she, had, she had a PhD in geophysics. And so I had, I had a lot of privilege growing up that not a lot of people do. So, um, you know, everybody's life is their own, but uh, the, the things that I've experienced and the pivotal moments that I've had um, have definitely uh, been through that lens, I guess. So... Um, but yeah, so the skiing thing. So I grew up, uh, again with my mom and, uh, we moved around quite a bit. So she worked for the, uh, the oil companies, uh, in Texas and New Mexico. And then she got a job as the, um, one of the geophysicists on site working at the old, uh, nuclear plant where they built the uh, plutonium for the bombs for world war II up at the Hanford site in Washington state. Yeah. So, uh, Moved from Houston, Texas to New Mexico, lived there for about six years. And then when my mom got that job, uh, we moved up to Washington State and it was a like, completely different environment. Um, short drive to the mountains. Um, I learned to ski in, uh, in New Mexico, but um, really kind of started living into it uh, up there in Washington, which is a beautiful state. I love Washington. Um, but ever since I was four, I kind of knew what I wanted to do with my life, which I, I guess is kind of a weird thing. I mean, a, a lot of folks, you know, they, maybe they go through a few iterations, especially, you know, little kids. Uh, my, my kids are just getting to that point where, you know, they, they can barely decide on what they want to be for Halloween, let alone, you know, what they want to be when they grow up. But um, I still remember uh, going to an air show uh, back in New Mexico uh, with my mom. And this was, uh, I want to say like 1989, 1990, like right before Gulf War One, uh, but at the the heyday of the of the fighter pilot age, and uh, I was standing out there on the tarmac um, with my mom, and I had my little baseball cap on and everything, and two F-16s flew over Show Center, um, and again, it was the 80s, the different rules, um, and they went to full afterburner right over the top of the crowd, just the loudest sound you had ever heard. Um, I still remember the way it felt like rattling in my bones and, and everything else just fell away as these two airplanes just like shot off into the sky. And at that point I was like, okay, I'm going to be a pilot. Four years old, decided that uh, and uh, everything else is history as they say. But uh, getting into high school and, and getting involved in sports and, you know, kind of all of the other things that go on with life in a position where it would be very easy to uh, kind of hold what I had. Um, I was lucky enough to, to get a chance to go ski. Um, I was on the regional traveling team uh, in high school, and I was racing some uh, NCAA Division I type races. Um, they call them the FIS or FIS races. And that was 
looking like it could have been a viable career path, I guess. I mean, I get in the off season, you'd go work on the, uh, on the mountains and, uh, and be a guide or something like that. But I had to make a decision between, like I said, holding what I had and I guess settling for, for what I thought was like maybe a sure thing. And then something that was a complete unknown, which was going into the military and, uh, and trying to be um, a pilot. And the, the level of competition for getting a pilot slot in the, in the military is extremely high. So um, I was kind of like, how do I, how do I even make this decision? Um, and, you know, as most of us that are no longer in high school, remember, like, how do you make that decision and also be a high school kid who has like no life experience? So um, it was, uh, it was kind of a big decision, but um, I had to remember what it is that, that I really wanted and not what it was that I just happened to have. And so kind of recaging, you know, my, my thoughts and my ideas and, and my motivations onto the goal that I had was my first experience with goal setting. And it was about as far from deliberate goal setting as I think you can get. So it was a, just happened to remember it and, uh, and got lucky in the choices that I made there. So what age was that? Um, I was 18 by, uh, by a couple months. Um, the, uh, the age of 18 is when you usually you're, well, so you're considered a legal adult in the U S but, uh, that's also when most people go off to college plus or minus a little bit. It depends on when they started their, their schooling and everything else. So. And <clears throat> what was it that, because you were obviously good at skiing, did you enjoy, did you, you know, was it one of those things you were good at, but it wasn't a passion. It, you didn't love it. So, so skiing for me was always, always a vehicle, I guess it was, it was a way to, to get somewhere. It was a way to learn. It was a, a way to, um, get friends and, and social interaction and everything else, be it, be a part of something that was more than just yourself. Um, and, you know, when I first got onto the, the traveling team, it was very much, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an individual sport, even though we have teams. So um, when, you're, when you're out there skiing, it's not like, you know, it's not roller, roller derby or anything like that. Um, but representing our division at the, uh, at the Junior Olympics was like the first, you know, real experience that I had with like, it's no longer just you. It was no longer just Nick skiing around. It was one of the members of the team and, and what that represented and what that meant to be a part of something more. So, um, I love skiing. I still love skiing. I really hope I can get my daughters into it uh, at some point, but, um, it wasn't necessarily like the end goal. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was a culminating thing. It was a, a, what can I learn from this? What can I take from it? And then how can I use that in the future? Okay. So at 18, you decided the pilot's job was for you. And then, then what happened? How did you, because you say it's highly competitive. So what was the process? Well, um, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to live in a, a relatively um, small town. And uh, there were not a whole lot of uh, people that wanted to, from that town that wanted to go um, and, and go to the Air Force Academy um, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So I, uh, I went through the interview process there and I, uh, I, I spoke with some of the uh, retired generals that sat on the panel. Um, it's funny because looking back on it, um, now that I know how to read rank, like looking around the room, there's like two-star army guy, there was a three-star air force guy, you know, there was you know, admirals and rear admirals from the Navy and like all of this really, really high rank guys that are, they're all retired, but this is what they did, you know, is kind of do these screening interviews. Uh, and I'm really glad I didn't know that at the time because I probably wouldn't have been able to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, yeah, so um, made it through that, and then I went to the Air Force Academy, which is a, a four-year college technical school. Um, but I think my my lightest semester credit hour load was like 19, 20, somewhere in there, um, and. It was my, my heaviest was like 23. I was taking seven classes plus a summer school and uh, just, it was, it was an experience. So. Wow. So you were drinking lots of caffeine? 
<laughs> yes, actually, um, there's a, a common joke uh, about uh, the amount of caffeine that the cadets would consume um, is directly proportional to how close it is to the final exams. Yeah. So we'd see the, the ca caffeine intake would spike, you know, usually in the, in the fall sometime, December before the holidays, and then again before finals for the last semester. But uh, the, uh, the pilot training um, didn't actually start until after that, and you had to get selected for a slot out of um, out of your schooling. We call it an accession source, but that's where you where you get commissioned from as an officer. Um, and I actually wasn't medically qualified to fly even at first. Um, I had to volunteer for a photoretractive keratotomy or PRK surgery for my eyes. All right. Which. Uh, this was 2006, I want to say. So um, relatively new procedure, uh, but, you know, take off the surface of your eye with a, uh, a metal toothbrush and hit it with a laser. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> you must have been scared. You know, honestly, I wish I could say that I was, but I wasn't smart enough to think about the repercussions of my actions at the time. <laughs> so it was like, oh, I got to do this. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, what about the thought of actually flying a plane? Because I remember, I mean, I, I wanted to do lots of things when I was growing up. Like you said, you know, nobody knows what they want to do at four. Most people don't know what they want to do at four. Um, but one of those mad things that came into my head was I wanted to be a pilot, but I was thinking about a pilot of a, you know, a, a plane, um, a holiday plane, you know, the normal planes that you would get going to Europe from the UK or whatever. So I actually looked at British Airways and I was too short anyway. So it was never going to happen. <laughs> so you had to be at least five foot four or five foot five or something. So that, that quashed that it's dream. <laughs> it's a brave new world. I mean, they got all kinds of adjustable cockpits these days. So yeah. like, you never know. It's never well, too late. I haven't got the balls to do it now. But when I was, <laughs> when I was younger, then I thought I could, you know, do anything. So did you, did you not think, oh my God, I'm going to be in these really high speed, planes and how the hell what if I freak out you know what was what was your thought process about it so I was uh, again uh, acknowledging privilege I was lucky enough to uh, to have a friend of mine whose father flew f4s um, in Gulf War one and uh, and his dad before him was an a6 pilot in the Navy uh, and so I had kind of this this wealth of knowledge just you know, he, he told me a lot of things and most of them, honestly, just right over the top of my head. Cause I just, so I, I kind of knew what to expect there intellectually. I, I still remember mine. Um, we, uh, we went through training at the, uh, at, at a school in Colorado. Um, again, love Colorado. Uh, but there was tiny little airplanes and had like a little, little engine in the front. And it was like just enough to get two people off the ground. I'm like, that was it. Very basic, um, nothing advanced, very slow. Uh, but my very first flight, um, I'd spent all this time studying and I you know, memorized my checklist, which you're not supposed to do, but you do it anyway, because you need to be able to run them quickly. Um, and I was, oh, I'm ready. It's my first flight. Um, we call it a dollar ride. And uh, so I went out and uh, we were airborne and like, I think um, maybe 30 seconds before is what it felt like. We had just started the engine. So like I was still like way back standing next to the, uh, next to the ramp in my head when we were already taken off, um, which is a common, common thing that happens in aviation. But uh, we took off and we were, you know, got up out of the pattern. We're, you know, over a thousand feet and I'm looking out the windows. just like, oh, this is really cool and everything. And then um, we had an engine emergency and uh, my instructor immediately declared an engine emergency on the, uh, on the radio to turn around and we landed. Wow. And that was, that was my, my first flight in an airplane. Wow. Um, turns out it was a gauge issue. So like just the indicator, there was nothing actually wrong with the plane. It was just, we thought there was so, um, but that was my introduction to, to aviation. So, um, and it didn't put you off. Yeah, it was, it was one of those things where, you know, there's going to be risk involved in everything. And I think kind of extracting something useful, you know, for, for the audience, for sure. Um, you, you know what the risk is, but you have to make that decision between is the risk worth the reward? And, and we do this all the time. And we do this at a subconscious level. 
uh, where, you know, you're, you're driving along and you want to turn lanes and you check your shoulder and like, okay, okay, is there a car there or not? Like basic stuff, right? I guess it'd be the other shoulder uh, for, for yeah. you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but being able to do that, uh, you know, in, in your conscious mind and thinking, hey, here's, here's the risks of what I'm about to go do. What is the reward? And then how do I balance those two things and make a decision off of that? And uh, a lot of that happens at the subconscious level because it has to happen very quickly. And I think I had an advantage with the, uh, with the skiing, um, being able to make rapid decisions that were, you know, very short time horizons and, and okay, if I don't do this right now, then just intuition, I know it's going to be bad later on. So I have to do this thing, but flying really makes you pull that out. It makes you lay it all out consciously in front of you because you have to make that decision to go get in the airplane to begin with. You don't get to that point unless you've done, you know, seven layers of studying and, and risk analysis and everything else before that. So um, when, when you do finally get into the airplane and you're the one flying it, um, I, I hate to quote Top Gun, but like, you just don't <laughs> yeah. have time to think if you think you're dead. Uh, not 100% accurate, but you, you're so involved in the things that you're doing and the decisions that you've already made and just executing those decisions that... Um, you don't really have a whole lot of time to think like, well, what if, you know, six layers later, you know, something catastrophic happens. You just have to trust that you're prepared for that. And I think honestly, that translates into life, right? You know, anytime you have a big decision to make, anytime you have to decide whether or not you're going to take what you have or, you know, roll the dice and gamble for something you don't yet. Um, that's where you have to be able to make all of those coherent decisions and, and weigh that risk and reward and then trust that, you know, you've made a decision and you're able to, to make the best out of it as you move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Easier said than done, Nick, as I'm, as I'm sure you appreciate. So, so you're still in the, um, is it classed as the Air Force? What's the proper name for what you do? Yep. Yeah, no, Air Force is right. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm a pilot in the Air Force. So. You, were, you, you mentioned in your bio something about security and defense. I wasn't sure whether that was slightly different. Yes. So uh, we, you know, I'm at a point in my career where we get tasked to do many different things. Um, I just came off of uh, a tour teaching um, and then doing some, some research-based things and, and uh, diving into leadership and, uh, and how do we make better leaders and, and how do we get people to, uh, you know, internalize the, uh, the concept of a good leader and what leadership is and all of those things. So um, we're, we're, we're not actually anything like the top gun guys. <laughs> we're, we're much more focused on like good leadership, ethical decision-making and so on in the context of national defense and national security. So. Okay, cool. So, so you're still doing that, but you, you also moved into speaking, public speaking and, and writing. So I'm guessing writing is something that you've always enjoyed. Um, but can you tell us sort of how all that came about? Absolutely. Um, the <laughs> first thing I ever wrote, um, well, that I have evidence of at least, um, I'm, every, oh, kids write stories all the time, but uh, I still have the story that I wrote in high school. Um, I had an interesting uh, exposure to literature at a young age. Um, I learned to read pretty early and uh, my mom was like not going to filter my, my reading at all. So uh, I, I, I dove right into science fiction, which uh, has some very interesting themes, especially, um, you know, I think I read Larry Niven's Ringworld as a nine-year-old. And so like, there's a, there's a lot of things in there that as a nine-year-old, I don't know what that means. You go back and read it <laughs> as in your early twenties and just, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, but I, I loved science fiction. I loved the way it could take you out of reality and put you into a different reality that was still like close enough that you could draw that really personal connection with the themes that was going on in the story as well as the characters and everything else. So um, it really made you think, what if it made you think about the future? So in high school, I wrote a science fiction story. I was really proud of it. It was like 32 pages long, which I thought was insane that I'd managed to turn that out as a, as a 17 year old high school kid. Um, and then I, saved it to a hard drive. And I honestly, I don't know how it made it out of my house to college. Somehow it did. Um, and then through all of the moves and, and hard drive upgrades and, and, you know, new computers since then, and I took it out, um, 
back in 2018. Um, and it was terrible. Yeah. It was really bad. <laughs> like the writing was stilted and the dialogue was like, people were talking for way too long and it was just, mm, but the, the bones of it were still there. And um, I had started doing a lot of professional writing um, through my, one of my master's programs. Um, I had to write a, uh, a 30 page thesis. Um, and it was the first degree I'd gone through that was a, a humanities kind of centered degree. I, I'd done my undergrad in uh, engineering and then did a, a master's in operations management, which is for, focused on supply chains and, and business, um, business piece of the industrial production. But this was a history-based master's degree. And so I had to write like all the time. And I found that the more I got, more I did of it, the, the better I got at it. Um, and so I went through the program and I finished my, my thesis and uh, I overshot my 30 page goal by a little bit. I think it was like 90 pages at the end. Um, but then I was like, I had this 90 page thesis. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I guess this is another one of those points where uh, do you just accept what you have or do you try and reach for more? Um, all credit goes to, uh, to my wife because she was the one that looked at it and was like, this is pretty good. You should... Uh, you should see if this is publishable somewhere. And I, I just kind of laughed because I'm like, I'm not... people don't just get published. Like that's not how that works. I didn't know how it worked, but I thought I knew that it's not that way. So yeah. um, lesson learned on, on my part. Uh, but from there, I started writing a little bit more and I did, did more reading. And I found that the more reading I did, um, and this was on the professional like nonfiction side, the more reading I did, the more thoughts I would have, the more I would talk to people about those thoughts and those thoughts would get better. And then the better my writing would become. And so I wound up, um, my first uh, published piece was in Over the Horizon Journal and it was on uh, joint all domain operations and building trust in effective teams. And by the time I'd finished it and it finally like went to press and, and, uh, and got published, like I think there'd been seven or eight different people on there. And I realized that being a writer isn't about coming up with all the best ideas. It's about being able to express the ideas that are good, not because they're your ideas, but because they are good ideas inherent of themselves. So um, that was kind of one of those like, now what do I do with my thesis? And so I turned that into a short form article and um, sent it off to my primary editor, who I also live with, and she tore it apart uh, as, as was right and good. And we put it all back together. Um, and that was kind of the beginning of what I would call my, my writing career, um, where it all kind of came together with the fiction side was, uh, I was, um, emailing back and forth with a, a professor at, at one of the schools that I had, that I had worked with. And she sent me this link to something called NavyCon. And I was like, what's NavyCon? Uh, and it's, a intersection of national security and defense. So things that I had already published in and I was writing in and I was interested in and science fiction, which I'd been interested in since like I knew how to read. And it was just like, sometimes the universe opens up <laughs> and, and gives you an opportunity. So um, I knocked out some quick ideas about uh, Battlestar Galactica and, you know, the use of the Navy and uh, the Expanse, which was like, I was big into the Expanse at the time, still am, love it, great series, uh, read the books, then watch the, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, that actually came back, they accepted me as a, as a speaker, it was all online, and I put together a talk and uh, joined their Discord server, which is a thing you do until the kids do Discord nowadays. Uh, and from there on, it was, uh, it was pretty much uh, what she wrote. And that was when the, the speaking side came in. So, so again, when was I was really that? lucky. How long ago was that then that all started? Uh, let's see. I think 20, I think it was fall of 2018 actually was, uh, was the first, uh, Navy con piece that, uh, that I spoke at. Um, and then working with, uh, the, the, the folks that do all the behind the scenes work at NavyCon. Um, it's through Texas A&M and the U.S. Naval Academy um, History Department, which great, great people all around. Um, Chris and, uh, and Ian are the two like ringleaders. So if you haven't seen it, definitely go check that out. Um, and then they had another one and I volunteered for that one, got picked up again. Um, and 
in between there was when I found out about um, an outfit called New Degree Press. And uh, New Degree Press is, uh, to coin a phrase, they're like the Taylor Swift of publishing. You know, she's re-recorded all of her own masters, so she owns all the rights to all her own work. New Degree Press is a hybrid publisher that um, basically lets the authors keep all of the rights to all their own work okay. um, and just assist them in the process of publishing. So it's more, it's more like aggressively assisted self-publishing than a traditional publishing house where all you do is send the manuscript off and then they tell you what to change and then they tell you what your cover is going to be and, and do everything. So I've learned a whole lot about the publishing industry there. But again, one of those pieces of, you know, do you settle for what you've got, right? Um, I had published a few articles in, in journals and I had, you know, gotten to talk at NavyCon, which was like amazing. It was a great experience. And I, I definitely want to go back and do it again. But writing a book and publishing a book are like, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, I didn't really realize how much at the time, but uh, I, I still had to make that decision about, um, again, what are the risks and what are the rewards and, and what do I want to do with the time and the resources that I have? So um, one thing leads to another. And, uh, you know, I, I've written a book now. It's coming out in December, but uh, that'll be kind of the... <laughs> Fingers crossed. We'll see if uh, if I am a author or a successful author because they're two very different things. And what's the book called? So the book is called uh, Steel in the Blood, and uh, it yeah it kind of goes back to um, the thing that I really love about science fiction was taking and creating a fictional world that you can use to examine real world uh, problems and themes and and things that might be a little bit. I guess, emotional to look at in reality, um, especially nowadays when, you know, at least in the Western sphere, we see so much polarization politically, socially, economically, all of that. And it's something that we all have to struggle with and, and, and you know, find our way through. Um, but being able to examine those ideas reality really lets us take a step back and say, okay, what do I really think about the idea of privilege? what do I really think about the idea of nationalism, you know, and, and why do I think that? And that ability to kind of work through that is, is kind of why I wrote the book, um, hopefully to bring that to other people, but also because I needed to do some of that on my own. So. So is it, um, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it's a, it's a, a way for you to express, is, it is science fiction, right? Yeah. So it's a way for you to ex actually express what's in your heart and mind, um, as well as being able to explore that through the realm of science fiction and, and you get to enjoy that as well. So you're sort of combining the, the, the human on the earth you with the science fiction you. Absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I ran into as a, as a, a tool, I guess, to to make decisions um, and to, to figure out, you know, what, what, do, what is it that I need to do um, and, and how I make decisions is metaphor. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with personality types, but uh, I'm, a, I'm an ENTJ right, okay. yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm an extrovert. Um, I'm a synthesizer. Uh, I'm a thinker and then a judger. So all of those have their own um, very specific definitions. But the, the thing that always jumps out when I talk to people is, is I need to see the big picture. Like I need to take all of the information and see how it all smashes against each other and like well, how, where all the connections are in order to actually understand something. And so metaphors are a really great way to do that, um, at least for me. They don't work for everybody. Some people don't find it helpful to, you know, imagine a literal field with cows on it as a way to think about the concept of the tragedy of the commons they prefer to just dive into the intellectual side and that's okay. Um, but art, uh, in, in my case, literature, uh, as, as that specific type of art really helps provide those metaphors that, that help me make decisions and help me, you know, wrestle with these complex and, and complicated ideas. So, um, again, going back to the idea of, of how do you make decisions? You know, what do you need to do, uh, to not settle for what you have and to try and strive to, to get to the next thing, use a metaphor, you know, um, 
write out what you think the future of your life looks like. Maybe you can write out what the future of somebody's life looks like. So it's not you, it's not personal, but you can say, Hey, if, you know, Kevin makes these decisions over here, what does Kevin's life look like in 20 years and write, write down Kevin's story. And then maybe you'll learn something while you're writing about what your character did that'll help you inform what you should do and where you should go. Cool. So, um, four year old boy to now, is the Air Force everything you wanted it to be? Oh, man. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I would say that life is everything that I wanted it to be. Uh, and, you know, going back to four-year-old me, I couldn't have been like, hey, you're going to love having kids. And four-year-old me would have been like, no, I'm not. I'm nah. four. <laughs> uh, you, you probably could have gone back to 23-year-old me and said, like, you're going to love having kids. And I would have said, no, I'm not. I'm never having kids, right? <laughs> and so, like, life, <laughs> life changes. Life moves on. Um, I don't regret any of the decisions that I've made to try and strive for more and to try and, and figure out a way to, to make myself better, to help other people around me get better and to, and to reach a little bit further. Um, one of my, uh, one of my close mentors, uh, has often told me that, uh, we talk about storytelling all the time, but, um, he told me the best stories are the stories that people talk about because of the story, not about the story. And so when you're thinking about your own life in the terms of the story that you want to tell your kids or your grandkids, or even to the you know, people that you love, like further down the line, if, if, if kids aren't for you, because they're not for everybody. But when you tell that story, you know, what do you want people to talk about because of your story? You know, do you want them to talk about the way you were courageous or do you want them to talk about courage? You know, there's, it seems like a subtle difference, but that really helped me to, to make those decisions. Um, but yeah, honestly, like life is really good. <laughs> I have no complaints. And um, you obviously married with children, two girl girls, is it? Yes, that's correct. And a speaker and a writer and a pilot. Did your wife ever see you? <laughs> yes, actually. Um, so she is also an aviator um, ah. in the military. So yeah. <laughs> It depends on the year. Sometimes she makes more than me. Sometimes I make more than her. Um, so it, uh, but yeah, no, we are, uh, we're pretty uh, right down the middle as far as the home life goes. So um, that being said, uh, the, the support that she's shown me to do all these other things that are outside of, you know, just being a pilot, um, I am probably forever in her debt for uh, and, and eternally humbled and grateful for. So um, I, I, Having a partner, um, having somebody there to support you is uh, is a huge piece of, of any sort of success. And I do the best I can to, to help her reach her own success as well. So yeah, wow, it sounds you sound like without trying to make this sound twee, but you've had a very blessed life. You know, you've been very you've been very um, what's the word clear in your mind as to who you are, what you want to do. And then as a result of that, this, you know, this creativity has emerged over the years. And, and obviously you've got the ambition and you said you're an extrovert and your mom sounds great in terms of, uh, she sounds maybe slightly kooky compared to other moms, <laughs> letting you read whatever you wanted and, and all of that sort of stuff. And obviously she was pretty, um, she sounded pretty ambitious as well. She was working for the oil companies, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. So she's a, she's a geophysicist. So um, I, I joke that uh, she's, she knows more about rocks than most people have forgotten, but uh, I, I still remember um, when we drove from New Mexico up to Washington, um, we had to drive through the Columbia river gorge and she pulls the car over and stops and, and we get out and she goes, look, and I look over and there's some rocks. She goes, look at those amazing salt columns you know they're, they're six-sided you know nobody knows why that happens like to this day we don't know why those columns exist that way and you know i'm seven i think it was six at the time when we moved and i'm like I, it's a rock mom i don't yeah. i don't get it but like that that wonder um that you can find in like even the smallest thing 
uh, the most mundane thing. Um, that is really a powerful piece of her that I still carry. So. Cool. Brilliant. Well, um, what's next for you? Obviously you've achieved quite a lot. Have you got, have you got a new challenge, a new dream? Is it a continuation of what you're doing? Oh, I think, I think it's a continuation of what I'm doing. Honestly, um, we are expecting another child here oh, congratulations. Uh, very soon. Um, probably not soon enough for my wife. She's, uh, she's like, all right, let's go. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that's going to be where my, my main focus is obviously is, is family first. Um, it's, it's funny, like going back into having a, a brand new baby, it really kind of like helps you shed all of the things that don't actually matter that you thought mattered a whole lot, but like, no, I don't actually need to sleep more than three hours at a time. <laughs> I, can I can still, you know, function. Um, so that's the near term. Uh, the, the book that I just wrote, um, that's, that's coming out in December, um, through the creative process, which is different for everybody, but usually feeds on itself. Uh, I have like, I want to say six more books planned in the series. Um, and so that's going to be, that's going to be a lot of writing. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty fast drafter. I can usually turn out a, a novel draft in a, in a couple of months, but um, that's like the first draft. And there's six other, you know, pieces of it. Whereas my wife, she writes, it's like, she puts it down on the paper and it's done. Whereas I have to put all the paint on the paper first and then I smear it around until it looks okay. That's, <laughs> that's my painting technique. But um, so that's where I'm going with the, uh, with the writing side. Uh, I hope to continue to uh, wrestle with the idea of storytelling and the power of storytelling. Um, I have a, a nonfiction book planned. Uh, <laughs> Lots of stuff in the uh, hay in the barn, I guess you could say. So um, we'll see how that starts to develop and uh, and see what uh, what useful things I can draw out of, out of that research, um, and then continuing to fly. Wow! Well, it, it sounds amazing, and you know, you do sound like you've just got it together. You know, like you just you just knew what you wanted, and you've got it, and you've got you know the great you've got you've got the the, the career the home life, the family, the passion that's, you know, that's on the side there that's building. Um, most people that's, would kill for that. That is so kind of you to say. Um, I'm glad it's coming across that way. It certainly is, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no secrets here. Like, I, man, at any given point in my life, you probably could have asked me what I'm going to be doing in five years. And I would have kind of thrown out my hands. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> so, you know, just Talk, talking out there to the audience uh, and to anybody who's who's wrestling with these big decisions, who's who's going through something that's like, hey, do I settle for what I have or do I strive for more? Like, you're the only one that's going to know what that right decision is, and you're only going to know after you've made it. So, <laughs> whatever that looks like, um, however you know someone can set an example or or uh, give you that mentorship, and that you know I've been there before. Here's what worked for me. Um, take advantage of that, but really know that, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. This is why I love science fiction, because like anything's possible, but most things are not probable. Um, so re-engage re that, that part of your brain that, that thinks about why and what could be happening, but really just, you know, trust in yourself to, to make those good decisions. And if you didn't make a good decision, remember that, <laughs> learn from that, you know, take that knowledge forward with you. And uh, the more knowledge you gain, the better decisions you'll make and the, and the more happiness and success that, uh, that you'll find. Well, you preempted that because I was, my, I always finish with any pearls of wisdom for the audience and you've just done it. So <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, very welcome. Nick, if, um, if the listeners want to know more about you and obviously what you're up to with the books and the talks, et cetera, where can they find you? Where's the best place? Absolutely. So um, I have a website. It's uh, narbatov.com. Um, I'm sure we can put that in the show notes, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. Perfect. Um, and then I'm also, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Um, less so on Instagram. That's, that's more for pictures of food that I've made that looks good. Um, <laughs> you don't get to taste it, so you can't tell if it's actually good. It's the secret. Um, I'll and have then, to get your uh, wife also, on then and ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so it's, I, 
watched way too much Great British Baking Show. Um, so nowadays it's, you know, I find myself waking up and, you know, all of a sudden it's nine o'clock in the morning and I'm pouring my dark chocolate ganache over my pumpkin, you know, <laughs> roll and it's the ginger goat cheese filling. And like, I don't know how I got here. It just wow. I blacked out and I woke up and it's done. <laughs> so um, looking forward to baking season. It's almost here. I'm ready. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much. And yeah, I'll put I'll put all those links in the show notes for people. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you and to uh, just to hear, you know, the the weaving of your life. And for me, I think what's really impacted me is just and I know you said, yeah, well, it's OK. In hindsight, five years ago, I didn't know what I was doing or whatever, but. There was still that sure footedness with you, there was still that, you know, that inner I don't know, drive, that knowing, that inner knowing, um, which some people just just don't have or struggle to find. So, um, yeah, that was really intriguing for me to listen to. So thank you so much, Nick, and thank you so much for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. No, the pleasure's all mine, Mel. Thank you. <laughs>